The MEK itself did not have the capability to falsify a set of documents as cleverly as had been done in the case of these, uh, of these documents that achieved such credibility. These were not crude falsifications. They were not crude fabrications. They were done by real experts, people who had done a lot of this work. And so if you were to try to figure out who actually created these documents, knowing the history of the relationship between the MEK and Israel, it would not be too difficult to come up with the conclusion that it was the Israelis who were, in fact, the creators of these documents, which, of course, is the, precisely the conclusion to which I came. But there's more in the story, which further, I think, underlines the certainty that that was the case. There's an important piece of information in my book, which cannot be found except for one other place. Uh, and that is that in 2003, just a few weeks after we know from other documentation, John Bolton, who was at the center of the neoconservative group in the Bush administration, who were planning this, this project of regime change in the Middle East, and who was the primary policymaker on Iran and the primary contact with Israel on the question of Israel, took an unauthorized trip to Israel. Unauthorized in the sense that it was not approved by the Near East Bureau, the State Department, which is the normal procedure. And he had a meeting, unauthorized of course, with the head of Mossad, Meyer Dagan. And in that meeting, we now know they discussed what the Israelis were going to do to help prepare to lay the groundwork for the case for war against Iran. And we know that a few weeks after that meeting, the Mossad created a new office whose purpose was, whose function was, to influence the perceptions of the world's governments and populations about the Iranian nuclear program. Now, I submit to you that there's no other country in the world that could possibly have had a special office in its intelligence organization whose purpose was to essentially manipulate opinion around the world with regard to the Iranian nuclear program. Simply impossible. Not, not incredible. So we know that Israel, more than any other country in the world, had the motivation to create this set of false documents to basically convince the world that the Iranians uh, had a covert nuclear weapons. We know that they had the capability to do it and that they had created an office whose function would be precisely to do this sort of thing. And finally, if you get through my book to the later chapters, you find that the documents that were turned over a few years later to the International Atomic Energy Agency, continuing to allege that Iran was carrying out secret work on nuclear weapons, that those documents could only have come from Israel. Indeed, Mohammed al baradai then the Director General of the IAEA in 2008-2009, when these documents were turned over by the Israelis to the IAEA, has said in his memoirs that those documents came directly from the Israelis. So I think we have a set of pieces of evidence that is extremely persuasive, extremely clear that it was indeed, could only have been the Israelis who fabricated this uh, set of documents which has been so influential in creating the false narrative of an Iranian 
nuclear weapons program. So now I'm going to skip to the present because I want to highlight the importance of this false narrative that I have been describing to the present juncture with regard to U.S. policy toward Iran and the negotiations that are now ongoing, the all-important negotiations between the P5 plus 1 and Iran. And of course, the United States playing by far the most important role in defining the negotiating position that will, in fact, be taken to the point where really no one pays any attention to the rest of the P5 plus 1, the positions that they might want to take, because everyone understands that it is entirely up to the United States to determine what negotiating position will be taken in those talks with Iran. And I want to emphasize to you my conviction that this false narrative that has been so successful in achieving credibility, so unchallenged really over the past several years, is now playing a crucial role, very silent of course. No one talks about it, it's not explicitly mentioned ever, but it plays a crucial role in shaping the negotiating position of the United States in those talks. The first reason that it is playing that crucial role is that the Obama administration has accepted the entire false narrative from the beginning to the end as the truth. In other words, they've accepted the, the idea that these documents, both the, the cache of documents that supposedly came from the laptop document and the later set of documents and, and intelligence reports that were directly provided by Israel to the IADA, that all of that information is genuine and accurate, and that indeed Iran had a nuclear weapons program from 2001 to 2003, that uh, it, it was only stopped from continuing that nuclear weapons program by the threat of the United States taking action against Iran and that the Iranians badly want to somehow get to nuclear weapons, that they're terribly eager to get to nuclear weapons. They cannot be trusted. And therefore, the conclusion that the Obama administration has reached based on that premise, that set of premises, is that the United States must take a very hard line in those negotiations. That it cannot rely on the goodwill or the rationality uh, of the Iranian government. And therefore, what now appears to be the situation is that the Obama administration is taking, is, is planning to take a position in these negotiations, and, and the preliminary talks have already begun, of course, about the, the major issues. But the Obama administration is planning to take the position that Iran must give up the vast majority of its uh, enrichment, uranium enrichment capabilities. That is to say, the gas centrifuges that it has used to enrich uranium in the past uh, decade. And uh, so that means that the U.S. is going to demand that Iran must go from the present 19,000 centrifuges to something like 6,000 or even less. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is, I would uh, suggest to you, a very, very serious likelihood that these talks will fail because the Iranians will not accept that demand. For one reason, the Iranians uh, have good reason to suggest to, to argue that this would violate the letter and spirit of the joint plan of action agreement that was reached last November because that agreement specifies that the two sides will reach agreement on a, uh, an Iranian enrichment program that has parameters, that's the word that's used, 
that includes parameters reflecting the uh, actual need of Iran for enrichment capability. Now, the Iranians have made no secret over the years that they have plans for more nuclear power stations, for more bouchers, if you will, more um, nuclear plants to produce power for electricity. And they have also, uh, I think, made it clear that they believe that they cannot depend entirely, certainly, on the international market for enriched uranium, which would be provided by companies in countries that would be subject to very strong and effective political pressure from the United States to cut off cooperation with Iran in the future. Despite the fact that, uh, or not, not despite the fact, because of the fact, I mean, that Iran's doubts about this, of course, reflect the fact that Iran has, in fact, seen over and over again that U.S. pressure on various governments which had carried out cooperation or reached agreements for cooperation with Iran on their nuclear program have backed off under pressure from the United States, going all the way back to the early to mid-1980s, but continuing through the 1990s as well. And these countries, these states that have been subject to U.S. pressure and have responded by agreeing to drop various forms of cooperation include China and Russia, the two countries that have been less hostile, if not non-hostile, to Iran over the years. So the Iranians have a very strong case that they cannot afford to agree uh, to uh, be dependent on an international market which would be subject to those sorts of political pressures such as they've seen in the past. And there's a second reason why Iran could not accept this demand, and that is that any government of Iran which accepted a demand for giving up 75% or even 80% of their centrifuges would never survive. It would never achieve election again. Uh, at the next election, you would certainly lose. That's guaranteed because public opinion in Iran is so nationalistic and so proud that, that the argument that this represents a bowing down to American imperialism would absolutely carry the day in any political campaign. And so, so it, the, the chances that this would be accepted by the Iranian government, uh, I submit to you, are very, very slight. And the consequences then would be, uh, I'm quite convinced, an extremely dangerous period uh, that would follow the collapse of the talks. A period that would be marked by increasing tensions, escalating tensions between the United States and Iran specifically. We saw escalation of tensions to some degree under both Bush administration and Obama administration, but I don't think we have seen anything like what would be likely in the event that these uh, talks collapse, because the first thing that we know is going to happen is the United States will impose more sanctions on Iran. No Iranian government could afford to fail to respond to new sanctions against Iran. And I would expect that Iran would begin to threaten to carry out some retaliatory uh, move that would involve the oil tanker traffic through the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, I think one would be foolish not to expect that to happen. And so at that point, things quickly become extremely unpredictable, just how fast and how far the two sides uh, continue to raise the stakes with threats and actual military actions on both sides. But in any case, I think that we are in a situation where the false narrative at this point represents a very serious threat to the fate of these nuclear talks. And therefore, I urge you to take this story 
not just as a problem of historical importance, but as a, a problem that affects the future of this country and the world. Thank you very much. which the 
United States recognized was a serious proposal. And that's what moved the talks from essentially uh, two sides getting together but disagreeing on virtually everything to the two sides really talking about reaching a far reaching uh, pact on the nuclear program. So, so I think it was all important. And, and indeed, what, what it tells us is that it was not the it was not the sanctions that were reached that were agreed to and, and carried out in 2012-2013 per se that brought the Iranians to the negotiating table. It was the fact that the faction which was concerned with integration, economic integration, had won because those sanctions did not have worked under Ahmadinejad. They, they did not work under Ahmadinejad. I mean, the Iranian uh, government did not change its policy under Ahmadinejad. So I think that's, that's the significance of those conditions. Did I miss a question? Or, or did you need something else? Well, I think we have a follow-up here. Yeah. So have, does the Obama administration, have they, have they backed off on their insistence in the negotiations about the reduction in the, in the uh, specific regions? Are no, no. This, this, this demand is brand new. This is brand new uh, since the Manchester's election in Milani, but after the November agreement. This is when the Obama administration made a decision to, uh, to go for a very deep cut uh, in, in central regions. Well, they need to chill. They need to chill. They need to chill. You are correct. I was wondering, have you ever tried to approach anyone? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, the answer, the answer to that is I do not. Um, I don't have any contacts in the Obama administration. I don't know anybody. Um, certainly no one um, in policy and position. Um, I've tried to get my story to the news media, and I've totally failed uh, in several, several efforts, either through the news part of newspapers um, or through op-ed pieces. And so, uh, yeah, I've been successful with that. I, um, I don't have any information to indicate that anyone in the Obama administration has read my book. I wish I could say that they had. And, and you are correct, and that is, that is a project that I am committed to actually carrying out, but I haven't had time to do it yet. Let us know. We'll do an email campaign. Well, that's that's actually very useful. I mean, you know, that would be very helpful, and, and I will remember that. Thank you. Maybe we should be um, pushing democracy now, meaning good to the Iran, because she had a lot in the past. Yes. And she said he's tried, and she doesn't. They don't respond. They don't respond. I can't get I can't get anyone uh, who has in the past been in touch with me. Uh, I've been on the program about five or six times. I can't remember exactly, but for the last couple of years, I haven't been on at all two and a half years, and uh, no longer get any answer when I, when I uh, send an email. I've sent uh, two or three emails laying out the story that I think democracy now should cover, and I haven't really got anybody to respond. And, you know, so I think that's, <laughs> something's wrong. <laughs> something's gone wrong. They've changed. Well, that's a very interesting observation. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you think it's because it's related to Israel or because of other reasons? Yeah, a lot of the left are confused about the And, you know, that's like a yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah. What do you think? The thing is that this might help educate them, though. Yeah. Because they have another question. Well, could you talk about, on the other side of the coin, the extent to which you think Iran and significant government uh, or scientific officials in Iran know about what you're talking about. And if they do know, why are they, I, I won't say why are they saying nothing, because I, they may be saying something and I don't know it, but we could talk about their point. No, that's a very good question. I'm really glad you asked it. And it's a very astute question because you've identified a bit of a mystery uh, surrounding the whole question of, of the Iranian nuclear program. Why is it 
that Iran has not had a very aggressive propaganda campaign uh, to match the propaganda coming from the United States and Israel. Um, and, and I mean, I, I can't answer it authoritatively. I don't have an inside source in Iran, but I can tell you that from my observation, I, I was in Iran briefly in late 2008. Um, no, I'm sorry, it was January 2009. It was, it was January 2009. It was, it was after uh, the election of Obama, but and, and before he took uh, took office, and he was naming his his uh, national security team. So I was there at a very interesting time. I could, could gauge the Iranian response uh, to specifically the naming of uh, Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. And I can tell you that the Iranians were not at all happy about that. And that the debate that had been going on about the Obama, about Obama, and whether he was simply a tool of the Zionists or in fact had some degree of independence and perhaps could expand that degree of independence as president, that debate was over when Hillary Clinton was named. And they simply closed the debate and, and it was agreed that, that he could not be trusted. And I, I, differ, I, I, I digress from your question, but what I want to say is that my observation is that the Shia uh, tradition the Shia culture, that is the Shia Islamic culture which surrounds the uh, Iranian regime, is one which assumes that Iran will be attacked, will be mistreated, will be the victim of the international community. And perhaps there's a certain uh, fate uh, faithfulness, a certain sense that uh, you know they, there's nothing they can do about it, and that it's not worth trying to put out uh, propaganda. I do know that it, it is a fact that if you, it's, it's very interesting if you compare the Israeli approach to public information about their foreign policy with the Iranian approach. It's like day and night. And the Israelis, of course, are extremely adept and take very seriously the need to propagandize, to use uh, all of the tools available, and they do use every tool available to great success. Uh, the Iranians, on the other hand, simply have never put resources into propaganda. It's simply not something that they've done. And uh, I mean, they've made very weak efforts. They there was a, a book a booklet that was put out, if I remember correctly, in 2000, 2007. I could be wrong about the year now because I haven't looked at it for a while. Which you know, made the case that uh, Iran had, not, had never had a nuclear weapons program and that, that they were being accused unfairly and so forth. Um, but, you know, it didn't, it didn't you know, really make the kind of effort uh, that you would expect to be made in response to this sort of uh, propaganda that which we should be talking about. And, and I do think that, that it does have to do with the Shia mentality of a victim of uh, that, that there's no point in it and they just don't feel that, that it's worth it for them to lower themselves somehow to getting into this sort of match. And of course, the cost has been, you know, significant. I mean, I think that they have suffered very, very much from the fact that they've not chosen uh, to put out uh, anything like an adequate response. Uh, and so, to your question, are they aware of my book? Uh, certainly, I think some people are aware of it. Uh, Press TV, you know, certainly aware of it. Um, I, I wouldn't expect them to make a big deal of it. I wouldn't expect them to hold it up and say, hey, folks, the rest of the world, take a look at this book. Um, I, I think it's just not their way. Um, and, and beyond that, I'm not able to give more of an explanation. So uh, I do think that it's an important point to do this. I, when, I mean, when we invaded Iraq, uh, the first thing I thought of myself was that you know, we're the Vietnam generation. I can't believe we're doing this again. 
And since then, it's become pretty clear that they had pretty good evidence that it would turn into a counterinsurgency type of Vietnam War. Uh, I know even at the time, and of course there were no weapon mass, weapons of mass destruction, I don't believe it myself, I'm sure a lot of Americans didn't believe it, but even those that did, uh, public sentiment seemed to believe that we should wait. And reading through the uh, uh, UN resolutions leading up to our declaration of our attack uh, invasion, uh, it, it was pretty clear that, that that investigation was proceeding well. And that's exactly what we should have done, you know, from that perspective. Well, what, what can the American people do? What can we do to change that mentality that, uh, you know, our government, we can trust our government, uh, you know, we, we glorify war as a, as a matter of patriotism and honor. Uh, we honor our veterans in, 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 in that same context. But there, there's kind of an emotional energy that just seems impossible to overcome. Uh, am I getting, does the question make sense? Sure, of course. I mean, you know, this is, this is certainly the ultimate question in a way. And you're asking what can be done about this play of, of uh, militarism and, and, and empire, if you will, if I may use that term, and I may not mind if I do. Um, and, and this is a question you wouldn't be surprised to know that has come up in previous uh, meetings that I've, at which I've still spoken. And, um, I don't have certainly a comprehensive answer, but I would say this, that um, I mean, the easy answer is, could you please find us a few billionaires who could put up uh, some real money to support an effort to educate the American people? I think that's job one. Um, and of course, when I say that, it's obvious that, you know, I'm asking the impossible, that's not going to happen. Uh, so why did I say that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving a hypothetical answer. But um, let's, let's skip over that point and, and get to the substantive issue of how do you, how do, if you have the money, how you, how you go about persuading most Americans or more Americans that they should uh, absolutely oppose not just wars that have gone bad, but oppose the very capability to fight those sorts of wars from now on. Say, no more wars, no more of the same. No more drone wars, no more ground wars, no more air wars, no more special forces wars. We've tried them all, they've all failed. They've all not just failed, they've all made us less secure, They've all exposed all of us in this room to greater danger of, of terrorism. I mean, not from out there, not from those ARAS, but from people in the United States who are so angry at what the United States is doing in the world that they want to kill Americans for, you know, in whatever way they can. So how do you do it? Well, my answer, I do have an answer to it because I want to spend the rest of my life working on that problem, and uh, so I've given it a lot of thought. And I believe that the, the, the approximate answer is to emphasize that this national security state, by which I mean the Pentagon, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military services, the CIA, the NSA, uh, for starters, that's, that's the core of the national security state. That those bureaucracies should be viewed as like a corporation. It's not like the army advertisement, you know, we're not a corporation, we're your country. Bullshit. Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the fact is that, that the Army and the rest of the national security state is a corporation. They act like a corporation. The only difference is that you know they don't make their money from selling products on the market. They make their money and get their power from congressional appropriations. But they've mastered the game to the point they have so much power that they're very, very good at it. And so the point I'm trying to get across is that 
we need to stop approaching this whole question of the war state and the national security state or the national security state as though it were somehow a, an enterprise that has some uh, reality apart from simply their own interests. That's all they are. They're pursuing their own interests. And I, I submit to you that there has never been a single case where the national security bureaucracies, or a national security bureaucracy has been given a choice between two courses of action on an issue, one of which would assist, would, would, would uh, increase their power and their profit, and the other which would not, in which they did not choose that course of action, which it would increase their power and their profit. And of course, in choosing that course, they are choosing a course that is going to be against our interests for all kinds of reasons, which you, I don't need to explain to you. And so that is the logic that I think has to be, we have to pound away at that. And it's not being done. It's not being argued. Uh, I mean, I think the left and, and progressive movement in this country, the anti-war movement, has, in effect, given the national security state a kind of pass, and given the military pass in particular. I mean, you know, it's always, you know, it's always the bad banks and the corporations that are behind everything. And nobody ever talks about the real culprit in this. Those people that, these bureaucracies that are the most powerful bureaucracies the world has ever known, they are the primary enemy. And we've got to recognize it, we've got to start pounding away. And so that's my thing. Thank you. Thank you. solar gout. Why don't they develop solar energy, make the Koch brothers really mad? <laughs> and um, I've heard that solar panels could be shrunk to the size of, of a transistor radio or whatever, so why don't they go whole hog on something like that and not lock themselves in this competition, just give it up? I think the answer is probably quite simple. It's probably the same reason that other countries, except for Germany and uh, one or two other European countries, have not done um, It's a lack of, of sufficient consciousness uh, and special interests, undoubtedly. I mean, look, I mean, they, they, have, they are a major uh, uh, energy exporter. To my knowledge, every single major energy exporter in the world has developed vested interests. Uh, the people who are in charge of that who have enormous power and who are not interested in alternatives to that. I mean, that's my guess. I don't know. I don't have the inside though, for it, but that's my guess. I've heard they do have alternative energy, even when no, no, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. But but the question of why they are not more radical about you know changing their entire uh, energy strategy and stopping reliance on nuclear um, and and all that. I mean. I, you know, I, it's, it's strikes me that it's a fundamental uh, political problem like uh, other political problems that has to do with uh, whose, whose acts um, is being ground. I mean, it's, it's whose, whose interests are engaged here. And uh, I mean, look, Iran, um, the Iranian economy is, is very distorted. It's a very distorted economy. Why? Because the um, the way in which it's evolved uh, is, is one that that has given great power to those people whose interests lie in not um, uh, sort of making the very far-reaching reforms. Uh, the IRGC, particularly, is, a, is an interest group that is not interested in economic reform because they're doing very well, thank you, the way things are. So, so I'm just, as a matter of principle, I'm arguing that you know, one would first of all look to this political structure and dynamics within the country as the reason why they have done. And you know, I, I, I think it's, it's um, similar to a, very, a, 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 lot of other, a lot of other cases, probably. Well, it seems like all of the crises are contrived. I mean, we're dealing with the Ukraine, yes. the Ukraine, 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 the Ukraine,
They're all yes. prescribed? Yes. They're no sugar. There's no sugar prices. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, you know, that's true. That's been true throughout the Cold War. Uh, there was never a genuine crisis. But what about the Cuban Missile Crisis? I mean, it was real in the sense that we were all exposed to the possibility of being blown up. Yes, but it was unnecessary. It wasn't over a real issue. It wasn't over uh, a, a, an issue that was genuine. Uh, it was because people like Maxwell Taylor and uh, Paul Nitsa, uh, people who uh, had, had nothing in common with ordinary people and who were out to, you know, to expand their own personal national security empires, got this idea into their head that you know, we could win a victory over the Soviets. We could cause the Soviets to be humiliated. And, uh, and they were like the neo conservatives, they're like the neo conservatives on the line, really. And so, you know, I would, I would say that yes, uh, every, every crisis has been phony in a sense, uh, in, some, in some fundamental way. And indeed, I would argue that uh, national security policy is never about actual situations abroad, it's never about what's really taking place in the Ukraine or in Syria. It's always about domestic politics. It's about either special interest groups in the United States, i.e., supporters of Israel and their preferences, or the bureaucratic interests of the national security state, or some combination of the two. Of course, they're not mutually exclusive. So, I think the general principle that you can be safely, uh, you can be safe in saying that uh, that these crises are always. Always false, false crisis. Yes, no, I just wanted to say when you mentioned the neocons around the Bush administration, that brought it all back, that whole era, you know, that one belongs to the other, you know, it's sort of a, a kind of relationship. Um, I think there was a neocon, wasn't there, who said something to the effect who said, yeah, he used to establish a beachhead in Iraq and then use that to then topple governments around the Middle East. Isn't there someone who said that Iraq is for the weaklings, but real men want to go to a terror or something like that? Yes, that's right. That was a, uh, that was a quote on that. At this moment, I don't remember who said it. Who said it? I didn't want to attribute it to a specific, a specific person. But it, was, it was from the neoconservative yeah. part of the Bush administration. Or Bush yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but what I think is so terrible and so tragic is that the neocons seem to be down after that, but they're not out, and they are active and alive and very present in the current administration. Victoria Newland. Victoria Newland, wife of Kagan, yeah. and all of these people, they're there, they're determining policy in, in the Ukraine, which has backfired terribly, they had other plans for Ukraine, they didn't know this would happen. And I think this is uh, something that they're doing. And, you know, if anything reveals what Obama is all about, it's the fact that he's relying on these neocons in the State Department to formulate his foreign policy. And I think it's just tragic and frightening. And, and, and I would just say that it's further evidence, uh, it seems to me, that uh, in fact it is domestic politics that determines, defines, uh, the U.S. position, the U.S. understanding of every single national security issue that we ever look at. And, uh, and of course, if you say that the neocons are, have been down and they're not out, they're still around. And the reason they're still around, as we were just talking about on the way over this evening, is that they've got such huge amounts of money behind them. They've got these big bank rollers that, you know, all over the that you know, pull down his pants and, you know, go, go down the street uh, and, and be booked for indecent exposure. And, you know, Sheldon Nicholson or somebody would still be bankrolling him at the AEI. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter how bad their record is. They've always got their backers. They're, there's always going to be big money. And that's why, you know, they can't be you know, run out of time. <laughs> Chuck and then Florence and Don. How's that? This is, this is like the off the top of it, but I've never 
never stop me before. Um, do you have any comments on what you see as Iran's political goals and role in Syria? Um, well, I would say, uh, you know, Syria is a frontline state for Iran in the sense that, uh, as, as Iran understands its national security situation, unlike the United States, Iran does have national security problems, national security concerns. Um, and uh, Israel and the United States, their military threat to Iran, of course, are at the center of their national security concerns. Syria is vital to Iran's national security because Syria is a huge part of the deterrent to attack on Iran. It's the Syrian missiles that have been developed over the past decade or more that provide much of the deterrence to an Israeli attack. And uh, so, logically, of course, the Israelis would like to get rid of the existing regime and bring to power somebody who would get rid of their deterrent and, you know, no longer be an ally of Iran. And the Iranians are very concerned about that, and that's why they are going to support Assad, whatever his faults, whatever his crimes, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, but it is interesting that, you know, it, it is apparently documented that at the beginning of the Syrian civil war, uh, the Iranians and Hezbollah were telling Assad, uh, you know, take it easy, chill out, you know, you don't have to use force to, against these people, you can handle it more deftly. Um, and so they were not happy with, what, with his approach to, uh, to his problem with protesters. But, uh, but it, it is a fundamental issue of national security for them, therefore uh, you, you shouldn't expect that there's going to be any wavering in their support. I guess that's what you what you want to Just one yeah. 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 Um, It just occurred to me that the neocons plan longer ahead. They, they're, they're in the structure, but they're not subject to elections every couple of years. I'm thinking of the Project for a New American Century. It was written in the late 1990s. And then to comment on this, and I think some of the same people helped Israel right there, a clean break. Which yes. is the same deal, it's a long term plan to remake the Middle East. Right, right. But I just got that notion of long term plans. Do you want to comment on that at the end? Well, I think there's something to that. that they, because they have you know, such a dogged determination to carry out fundamental you know, realignment, <clears throat> basically, of course, joint US Israeli hegemony over every part of the Middle East, because they're so ambitious. They recognize it's going to take a while to do this, and so they do, in fact, you know, plan and plot well ahead of time. And, and uh, you know, that is, that is clearly uh, an asset uh, that they have in terms of their operations. And the problem, of course, with the New is that they live in some sort of parallel universe which has nothing to do with reality. Uh, you know, but, I mean, they are like the U.S. national security state only, you know, very much worse. I mean, you know, the U.S. national security state you know, makes decisions uh, to use force uh, completely unrealistically. I mean, it's, it, it never works out the way they plan. It never works out the way they want. Never. 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 And yet they continue to do the same thing over and over again. But, I mean, the, the Israelis, uh, forget the Israelis, the, the neoconservatives, who, who are not the same as the Israelis. They have differences. They're more ambitious than the Israelis. The Israelis are more realistic than the neoconservatives. And, and in fact, you may, some of you may know this, that, that during the Bush administration, the neoconservatives in the administration wanted and expected the Israelis to attack and overthrow the Assad regime. Uh, I mean, they were very disappointed and they made it known publicly to the Israelis that they were very disappointed 
that they hadn't done that in 2006, 2007. Um, and so there's a big difference. But the neoconservatives, I mean, they just don't live in the real world. They're so far removed from the other, much more removed even than the Pentagon and the military services. And so, I mean, that's why they're such a threat. Now, supposedly, the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty should be the controlling document, and the uh, Iranians have signed it, so they have absolute legal right to develop nuclear power, and having all these centrifuges, etc. And that uh, uh, someone who has not signed it, namely the state of Israel, is all too willing to enforce it for everybody else, although they themselves uh, have developed their own nuclear weapons. But and then we have, of course, uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, where the uh, state of uh, India, who had signed it, but then went ahead and developed nuclear weapons and exploded them, uh, they were given a pass. Don, Don, are, are you suggesting that the nuclear regime globally is not fair? Uh, well, I, I was hoping you might. Uh, and so they gave India a pass, and they said, well, uh, just because you're such a big power, and maybe you can help us with China and all, and then uh, we'll give you all this other nuclear technology. Anyway, why don't you talk about that in the International Atomic Energy? Well, I mean, you've pinpointed uh, really a fundamental issue in, in global politics. And this, of course, this is an issue on which the Iranians have been very vocal. Um, they don't put out so much propaganda in the same way that Israelis have on the Iran nuclear program, but but they you know they emphasize this issue of the unfairness of the global regime uh, surrounding nuclear weapons and nuclear power um, all the time. And the reason that they do so is that they know that most the vast majority of the world's countries support them on this. It is it is so widely recognized around the world that this is a completely unfair uh, system that was set up by the United States and its nuclear allies to maintain their power in the world against the wishes and against the interests of the vast majority of the world's people. So I mean, that, that is really, I think they're right. I mean, and, and it's not just me, it's not just the Iranians. Uh, virtually everyone who has bothered uh, to look at that issue does not have, is not getting, you know, sucking at the, you know, U.S. national security tit, uh, you know, understands that, and it's, like, admits that that's the case. Uh, it is, it is so obvious that, that, that this is a system that um, uh, does not respond to any objective um, values or any objective criteria. It's simply uh, arranged and, and organized and carried out in a way that is determined by the most powerful states. So it, it, it's a ticking time bomb, though. I mean, it's, it's still extremely, it makes a lot of states, and not just, you know, small, weak African states, uh, but, you know, rising states like Brazil, Argentina, well, okay, Argentina is not a rising state, but, you know, uh, middle, uh, uh, mid-range states, that do, you know, have some importance in world politics um, are, are not happy at all with this system. Uh, partly because, you know, they want to have their own nuclear rights and, and this is uh, seen quite rightly as a, as a way of preventing, preventing them from exercising.